last week on Thursday in the last class to get us up to date with where we are. Um, basically, last week we finished talking about the macromolecules, if you remember. We went over carbohydrates and lipids. And so we're picking up with proteins today, and then we're going to talk about nucleic acids after that, go on to chapter three. But last Thursday, we also described a little bit about pH. We talked somewhat about that. And I think, yeah, we talked about hydrogen bonding, and then we picked up with pH. So let's discuss pH a little bit. So what does pH stand for? Potential hydrogen, right. So <clears throat> what if, uh, which, which, which pH solution would have more hydrogen? A pH of three or a pH of five? Three. three, yeah. The lower, remember the lower the pH number, basically, <laughs> I shouldn't use that word. The lower the pH number, the more acidic a particular solution is, meaning that we have more hydrogen in it. The higher the pH number, the less hydrogen we have, the more basic it is. So if we had a pH of, say, two, what would the molar concentration of hydrogen be? Oh, you're staring right at me. No, I'm sorry, I was looking at Heidi, but I mean, maybe it's self-conscious. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think I was looking at her. But. It's, well, actually it's point zero 0.01, you're right, but if we were going to say that exponentially, it would be 10 to the negative 2, right? So pH of 2, the molar concentration is 10 to the negative 2, right? If it's pH of 8, what would the molar concentration of hydrogen be? 10 to the minus eight, right, exactly. So it's always that molar concentration is what determines the pH number because the hydrogen is what we're really measuring. Now on that chart that I'm referring to, you'll see that there's another column with the um, hydroxide concentration, which gives us an idea about the basicity of the solution. Um, and the main reason why I talked about that you don't have to know the molar concentration of hydroxide, but it is nice to see that it's pretty much opposite. You know, as we go up the pH scale, when we get to a pH of 14, that's the most basic, and we have a molar concentration of hydroxide as one, versus a pH of zero, where it's the most acidic, our molar concentration of hydrogen is one. So it's just inversely. But if I were asking you any molar concentration question, I would ask it to you about hydrogen, not hydroxide. So don't worry about that. And with hydrogen, it's easy. It's just the negative exponent of the number that the pH is. Now the pH of seven, why do we call it neutral? Because why? Pretty much before pH of seven, we always have a higher concentration of what? Hydrogen or hydroxide? Hydrogen, right? That's because from a pH of zero to a pH of 6.9, we say that that's the acidic range, right? So we have more hydrogen than we have hydroxide. When we get to a pH of eight, now we have more what? Hydroxide, right, which is why from a pH of eight to 14, we consider it to be basic. But a pH of seven is neutral, why? Because it has equal concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide. And again, if you look at that table, you'll see that. Okay, so we discussed, let's see here. We discussed that, and this is the table that I'm referring to. Again, um, if I asked you any molar concentration question, it would be about hydrogen, and the exponent is always, you know, if it's a pH of zero, concentration was one. And then from, from pH of uh, one all the way to 14, molar concentration is always the ne negative exponent of that number. But I said that, you know, from a pH of zero to a pH of 6.9, if we look, our molar concentration of hydrogen is greater than hydroxide, but once we pass we get to eight, a pH of eight, it's, it flips. We have a higher hydroxide than we have 
hydrogen, and so therefore this is considered to be the basic range. Where in the pH of seven, we have equal concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide. So that's what I was referring to. All right, another thing that we discussed was this, the idea of a buffer system. And remember, buffer systems are those in which um, we have like a weak acid or a weak base that can associate or disassociate depending upon the situation at hand. So we were discussing basically blood pH, which is between which range? What is the range of normal blood pH? Seven. Seven. You're close, yeah, 7.35, so 7.45. You just forgot the five, that's all. The point zero five. Right, so 7.35 to 7.45. Now, we were discussing pretty much this area right here. We didn't, we said we're going to talk about this later because that has to do with the respiratory system. But just looking here at this, okay, um, if we had a pH, say, of 7.2, is that too acidic or too basic for the blood? It's too acidic, right. So in that case, okay, that means we have too much what? hydrogen, right, because that's what makes something too acidic if you have too much hydrogen. So what direction would this go? Would this proceed to the right and form hydrogen and bicarbonate, or would it go to the left and form carbonic acid? It'll go to the left. Why? Because if we have too much hydrogen in our, in our, in our blood, we need to take it up. So what takes up hydrogen? Bases. And this is bicarbonate, which is a good weak base. So it takes up the hydrogen. We have two hydrogens, a, a carbon and three oxygens. So we have H2CO3, which is carbonic acid, right? So that's what we're gonna produce if the blood becomes too acidic. And again, don't get confused. Don't think, wait, we're, have, we're producing an acid when it's too acidic, but remember the definition. An acid doesn't by itself make something acidic just because you have carbonic acid there but it has the potential to because it can donate hydrogen to that solution that's the definition it can donate hydrogen to a solution if it's an acid all right so now if the ph gets to um, 7.6 then now the blood is to what basic basic so now we need to add hydrogen right it's kind of like you know buffers are kind of like cooking sort of like if you're making a tomato sauce for spaghetti sometimes it's too salty sometimes it's too sweet so you know if it's too like salty then you add some sugar if it's too sweet you add a little salt you know to balance it and that's basically what buffers are doing depending upon the circumstance they're going to adjust so if it's too basic what direction do we go to the right or to the left mm -hmm. to the right because if it's too if it's, if it's too basic, that means we need more hydrogen in the solution. So this is what's going to form, hydrogen and bicarbonate ion. So that is the what we call the bicarbonate buffer system, carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, which we're gonna talk about a few more times during the course of the class. All right, so um, then we talked a little bit about uh, organic uh, molecules and we uh, talked about some functional groups. Does anybody remember? Okay, so functional groups, first of all, are important. Why? What do they do? What, what's important about a functional group in, a, in an organic molecule? What do they do? They usually do what? They. Is any mind touching on your conditioner? Because that's the area usually where molecules bond with other molecules to form macromolecules or larger molecules. Now, what functional group do we usually see in organic alcohols? Okay, 
Hydroxyl. Hydroxyl. Good. What about organic acid? Well, we can go back. We can look. Acids, we usually have the carboxyl. So remember carboxylic acid when we were talking about triglycerides, fatty acids. We had glycerol, three fatty acids, and the, we call it a fatty acid because we have this long hydrocarbon chain attached to carboxylic acid. And it has a carboxyl group, which is why it's called carboxylic acid. What about ketones and aldehydes? Carbonyl group, right, carbonyl group. Very good. Now what makes a molecule organic is the fact that it contains carbon and it contains hydrogen, right? So it doesn't mean that it was produced without the use of pesticides. It means that it has carbon in it. That's what makes something an organic molecule. Okay, uh, next we talked about car uh, carbohydrates and carbohydrates usually have a a, um, a ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen in what particular ratio? One, one to two to one. One to two to one, right. So glucose would be C6. H12. H12. O6. Excellent. Good. So that's pretty much the way it always is. Now, what are some monosaccharides that we have? Glucose. Glucose. Fructose. Fructose. Galactose. Galactose. Okay, what about disaccharides then? What disaccharide, uh, let's see. What are some, name some disaccharides and tell me the monosaccharides that make them up. Okay, you said lactose, sucrose. Okay, sucrose, what, what are the two simple sugars that come together for that? Glucose and galactose. Glucose and fructose for sucrose. Glucose and fructose. Now you said, what was the other one? Galactose? You said galactose? Who said that? Or no, you said lactose, right? Who said lactose? Nobody. Maltose? Maltose. All right, let's do maltose. Which, which <laughs> I don't know. What, two so, glucoses. Two glucoses, right. And what's the third one that we talked about? Lactose. Lactose, which consists of what? Glucose and galactose. Glucose and galactose. Very good. Now, a more complex question. What is the name of the type of reaction that forms disaccharides from two monosaccharides? Or basically, in general, builds a larger molecule from smaller ones. What kind of reaction does this? We talked about two types. Two types of reactions so far in this class. Dehydration and what's the other one? Well, dehydration and condensation are synonymous. They do describe the same. Hydrolysis is the opposite, right? So, what type of reaction did you say, or would you say makes a larger molecule from smaller ones? Dehydration. Dehydration. Excellent. Perfect. Right. Dehydration. So we call it dehydration because. We form this bond, but how we form the bond is we actually make water. We extract water from the two molecules we're bonding together. So we're dehydrating those. Now, if we wanted to take a, a disaccharide and we wanted to break it down into two monosaccharides, or just in general, make two smaller molecules out of a larger one, what type of reaction would we then use? Hydrolysis. Lysis, remember, means to break apart. We'll see that suffix many, many times in many words throughout this class. So hydrolysis specifically means that we're using water to break apart larger molecules into smaller ones. Very good. Okay, so one other thing about, um, another thing about carbohydrates. What is the storage form of glucose in humans? There's a, a particular molecule, it's a polysaccharide, it's a very large molecule where we can string a bunch of glucoses together to prevent osmotic disturbances. What's the name of that? Glycogen. Glycogen. What's it called in plants, this, this storage form? Starch. Excellent. 
Very good. Starch. Good. That's it for carbohydrates. Lipids. Going on to that, and then finally we get into proteins, which is the new macromolecule for today. Um, lipids, we have a couple of different types of lipids that we talk about. Which type of lipid is responsible, I'm gonna start out with the tough one, because it's something that um, you probably weren't, well you could have been, because on some of the makeup renewal commercials they use this stuff, but what type of lipid is used um, to make uh, micelles, micelles, or which uh, act as surfactants? I'm sorry, would you, would you, would you say? No, 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 a type of lipid, a type of lipid. What did you say, Lauren? Phospholipids, right. So phospholipids, are special lipids because how how would you describe their structure? What are they made of? What two main components make up a phospholipid? It's in the name. Phosphate and there's only one other part in the name. Lipid. Lipid. <laughs> awesome. This is great. Good. Okay. So specifically, we say we got a phosphate group and we have fatty acid chains, right? which is our lipid part. Okay, so how many fatty acid chains do we have attaching to our phosphate? One, or one, two, three, five, six, 20, uh, Try again. <laughs> well, how many, how many do we have? I gave you two choices, two or three. Well, it's not a triglyceride, it's a phospholipid, we have two two fatty acid chains attached to the phosphate. What's special about the phosphate? The phosphate is what? How, what property does it have? It is, is it able to interact with water or not? Yeah. Yes. Phos I was just trying to trick you. Uh, you. You are making me think hard today. <laughs> the phosphate head, the phosphate head is the polar part. It can interact with water. And the lipid part, we know fats can interact with water, right? I mean, try to put oil in water and see if they mix. You can try all day, they're not gonna do it. The lipid, the fatty acid chains are the nonpolar part, and the nonpolar part cannot interact with water. So why is this good for phospholipid and makes it so great to become a micelle, or where else do we find them? Not just in these micelles, but where else? lungs, well, my cells are found in the lungs because we've we got surfactant, right? So it's possible that it's, I'm sorry, what did you say? Around membranes, they make membranes as well. Any organelle, any plasma membrane, anything, phospholipids are there. Why? Because in terms of making a membrane, we have a bilayer. We have two layers of phospholipids. Why two layers? Because we have the tails, which cannot interact with the water that face each other, and the polar phosphates can face the watery environment inside of the cell and outside of the cell, or inside of an organelle and then outside of an organelle. So phos phospholipids are important for making membranes, and we find them anywhere you see a membrane in the, in the body, in a cell or organelle or whatever. Now, they were also, we mentioned earlier, my cells, okay, so what are my cells? They're basically little lipid spheres. The polar head groups surround the outside and interact with the water, and in the middle, we have the fatty acid tails that face each other. So they make good surfactants, and the lungs, the alveoli, will produce my cells because when you have something that's big like that, um, it will disrupt hydrogen bonding between water molecules, which basically makes it easier um, for there to be less surface tension. You don't want the surface tension because that would cause the alveoli to collapse. Okay, so that is uh, the phospholipid. Now, what type of lipid is the main energy storage form for the body? You guys are on fire today. You really are. I mean, you were answering a lot of questions early on, but 
mean, I'm not being sarcastic. So sometimes I sound like I'm being, like, I'm, but I don't mean to be like that. I'm, I'm actually complimenting you. <laughs> okay, so you're you're proving uh, that I could have meant that sarcastically because you are standing there with your hands up your gun. No, what is the what is the lipid that is the energy the main energy source for the for the body? Which type of lipid provides energy? So we got the phospholipid out of the way. We know what it does. What's the other one? Big one. And I referred to it when we were talking about the phospholipid. Triglycerides. The triglycerides, absolutely. So what can, what is in the structure of the triglyceride? Where are we at? Three fatty acids. Three fatty acids, hence the tri part. Glyceride means that we have what? Uh, glycerol. Glycerol, right. Which actually, interestingly, is also found in antifreeze. Cool. So, huh? Cool. <laughs> good. That was a, that was good. Little pun there. Cool. <laughs> okay. So triglycerides. You you meant to make that pun, right? No, but thanks. Okay. <laughs> no, I got that right. <laughs> that was pretty good. All right. So anyhow, um, okay. So triglycerides. We have glycerol, three fatty acids. Why are they such huge energy storage molecules? because they have so many bonds. And we're gonna see that when we get into metabolism, that there's so much in one triglyceride molecule, so many bonds that we can break. And when we can break bonds, boom, we can make energy. Hopefully not boom. But one thing I just wanna point out, what I mentioned earlier about those functional groups, you can see them here uh, for this <clears throat> diagram of this triglyceride. Um, and I mentioned that the functional groups are where they bond together. So if you look at glycerol, usually when you have an all at the end of a word, it means it's some type of an alcohol. This is an organic alcohol and it does have the hydroxyl group as a functional group. And the carboxylic acid, of course, having being an acid, it does have the carboxyl functional group, which is in the name. So here we have C double bonded to O, OH, and notice that that part of the carboxyl group is going to help to form a bond with the hydroxyl group. So what I said earlier can be illustrated here. You can see this, the functional groups do actually interact. That's what makes them functional. They do stuff. They mainly help with bonding. So the other thing that you see here is that you're gonna remove this hydrogen and this hydrogen and oxygen you have two hydrogens and an oxygen, you're gonna make H2O, right? And that's how we're going to form, so basically we'll have this oxygen left and the bond will form between the carbon and oxygen, which you see over here. This happens three times, so we have three molecules of water that result. And what type of reaction is that? Dehydration, which forms larger molecules from two smaller ones, or three or four smaller ones, like we see here, glycerol plus three fatty acid chains. Okay, and lastly, we had our, um, our um, hormones. We were talking about steroid hormones like estrogen, testosterone, testosterone, and cortisol. And what is the lipid that is the backbone for these molecules? What is the, the, the lipid that is basically going to, we're going to derive all of these hormones from it? It's also found in plasma membrane, helps with the fluidity of it. And there's an interesting thing, you don't even have to eat it, because your body can make it if it needs it. Think of a fat that you know isn't good for you. Think, think uh, yolk of the egg. Um, saturated? Well, you're thinking saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, but I'm thinking of a different kind of lipid that's in there. Not a triglyceride, but actually this one you know is bad for you. Yes, cholesterol. You know you don't want cholesterol in your diet. In fact, you really don't need to. This is what I mean. 
you, you can make whatever cholesterol that you need. But the point is, is that cholesterol is the, the backbone. It's basically where all of the lipid hormones are derived from. And lipid hormones are things like testosterone, estrogen, and cortisol. Okay? So that's what we covered, and it was a pretty comprehensive review there. So uh, now I think we can safely go on to proteins. And if you want to go and talk about, again, if you want to ask some questions or you want to talk about some of these things more slowly that we discussed on Thursday, we can have a review session today at 2 uh, till 3 o'clock. So if, you, if you're inclined to come, that would be fine. Um, all right, so next macromolecule, we have two more to go. We had carbohydrates, we had lipids, we have proteins, and we have nucleic acids. So proteins are, they're kind of like phospholipids. They're very, very abundant in the body. Proteins can be so many things. I mean, for example, in the next chapter, we're gonna talk about ribosomes, which are little organelles that make proteins. But interestingly, they are protein. So ribosomes, they are protein. Um, any enzyme, and there are thousands of different enzymes that we have, we're gonna talk about what those do a little bit later, but they usually help reaction to occur. Um, we also have, when you think about the connective tissues and what you guys know about connective tissues, right? That we talked about at the end of chapter one, we said in the matrix that we have all these protein fibers, right? Collagen is protein, um, we have elastic fibers, reticular fibers, all that stuff is protein, 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 right? Everything. So those are just some, some, a few, I guess I could say, a few examples of proteins, but there are many, many, many more. So proteins are very important and they're found all over. But interestingly, they are made from the same building blocks of which there are only 20. So what are the building blocks of proteins? Amino acids. Okay, so let's take a look at the amino acid first. An amino acid is shown here on this diagram. Each amino acid, doesn't matter which one of the 20, has an amine group, amino, which is nitrogen bonded to two hydrogens, aka NH2, that's an amine, amine group. And then we have a carbonyl group. I'm sorry, a carboxyl group, not carbonyl. Carboxyl group uh, that is on the other side of it. Now, what are carboxyl groups generally associated with? What did we say? Carboxyl groups are functional groups found in what? Would you say? I think you might have said it right. No, I didn't. No, okay. What was it? What what are carboxyl groups found in? For example, we just saw an example with the triglyceride, right? Glycerol fatty acids. What was a component of that fatty acid that made it acidic? Carboxylic acid, right? So what kind of group is associated, what kind of functional groups associated with acids? What was the functional group though? Uh, Remember we had hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl. Okay, so maybe go back and look at that slide again that shows the functional groups. Remember, hydroxyl groups with alcohols, carbonyls with ketones and aldehydes, carboxyl groups with acids. So here we have an amino acid what makes it an amino acid? It has an amine group on one side and a carboxyl group on the other side. Carboxyl groups are associated with acids. So that's the amino part and the acid. And then every amino acid has these two things, but then they also have something else, which here is highlighted in gold, and it's an R, which means it's a reactive group. These are different for each amino acid. It's what gives it its own property. Some amino acids are polar, which means they can interact with water, and some are nonpolar, which means that they cannot. So interestingly, it doesn't matter if you're a paramecium or if you're 
a great elephant or a plant or whatever, all living organisms have only a pool of 20 different amino acids that can be used. As I said, amino acids contain an amine group and a carboxyl group, which is the acid part. The differences between amino acids are due to differences in this little R here, which they've shown some of the functional groups of some of the other amino acids. And again, some of them are gonna be nonpolar, which means they can interact with water, and some will be polar, which means that they can. And that's important for making a protein properly. So for example, um, say you had a channel that you've embedded into the plasma membrane, a channel for which things can pass. A channel is a protein, and if the protein had, if it didn't have, say, polar amino acids that face the inside component of that channel so that they could interact with water, that channel wouldn't work properly. You need to have the nonpolar amino acids facing the fatty acid part in the phospholipid membrane. So that's why you have different properties with these amino acids, some being polar, some being nonpolar. Okay, so let's look uh, now how proteins are produced. So two amino acids that are linked together are called a dipeptide. When we see the word pep, or peptide, and really we see pep, P-E-P, we're talking about proteins, okay? So for example, I don't know if you'll recall this, but in the stomach, in the stomach there is a, an enzyme called pepsin, and pepsin breaks apart the proteins in the stomach. So you see another word that has the PEP prefix. Peptide bonds are specifically bonds that are formed between amino acids. Now, what kind of bond do you think, out of the bonds that we talked about at the beginning of this chapter, what kind of bond do you think a peptide bond is? A protein bond? Okay. Yeah. It's a protein bond, yes, but what kind out of the four that we talked about at the beginning of this chapter? We talked about four types of bonds last week over in the other classroom, remember? Which one do you think would be a peptide bond? I think it's hydrogen, I think it's ionic. Remember, I told you guys that nonpolar covalent bonds, you're gonna find pretty much binding the components of macromolecules because it's the strongest and most stable bond type. And these molecules are very strong. There are some exceptions, which I'll point out. But a peptide bond, just like any other bond, is, it's a, it's a, a bond between amino acids, but it's nonpolar covalent in terms of classification. So here we have an amino acid, and here we have our carboxyl group, right, the acid part. And here's the uh, oxygen and hydrogen of that. And then here we have an amino group, which is another functional group. And we have, it's hydrogen. So we're gonna get a bond between this carbon and the nitrogen, see, ultimately. And what do we produce in the process? We're gonna produce a molecule of water. So what kind of reaction is this? That's the kind of bond, but what kind of reaction forms that bond? Out of the two that we discussed. Dehydration, right, and here it says it on the slide. So it's formed by a dehydration <laughs> reaction. No, that's okay. I mean, not all of my questions are that obvious, but you know, with the information on the slide, truthfully. And sometimes I don't even know what's up there, so, but I did know that was up there. Anyhow, okay, so uh, do you have any questions about that? You see how, we're just saying the same kinds of things over and over again, just applying to different things. It's not like this is all new. So the amino acid, uh, you know, we're just reiterating, we have the acidic part, which is our carboxyl part. We have the amino part, which makes an amino acid. You see all these R's, which are the reactive groups. They don't draw them because it's more complicated than it needs to be for what they're trying to show. 
This is just showing the two functional groups reacting with each other, forming a molecule of water in the process, making it a dehydration reaction. So if you have less than 100 amino acids, we usually call it a polypeptide, which means it's a protein made of many amino acids. But if it's greater than 100 amino acids, then we call it a protein. So most proteins are, you know, when we talk about enzymes or ribosomes or collagen or any of that stuff, we're talking about proteins made of more than 100 amino acids. So that gives you an idea of how large they are. Okay, so proteins can be described at four different levels. We have the primary structure. So when a protein is being produced, and uh, again, do you remember the name of the organelle responsible for producing proteins in the cell? Ribosome, right. On a ribosome, when the protein is being made, initially, we have to get these amino acids through dehydration reactions. We need to form these peptide bonds between them. Okay, so initially what we're doing is, just like if we were making a necklace, we were making a necklace and we were adding beads to that necklace. That's basically the primary structure of a protein like beads on a string. Each amino acid would be like a bead and the peptide bond between them would be like the string. So we would have um, basically a linear structure. But this doesn't last very long. It doesn't last very long because why? Because we have all these reactive groups as part of the amino acids. And they have different properties that are going to make them want to interact with each other and cause the protein to fold very quickly into the secondary structure. The secondary structure can assume two basic forms. We have a helix, an alpha helix, we call it. Alpha is just basically a, a Greek uh, letter for A, if you want. And then we have uh, another form that it can take, which is a beta pleated sheet. And this is a lot like if you made yourself a paper fan, you know how you fold it back and forth. That's pretty much what the beta pleated sheet would look like. Just sort of like a protein that's sort of zigzagged like that. So those are the two forms it can take because again, when we're in the primary structure, beads on a string, we have all this interaction happening between the reactive groups that are gonna cause us to quickly fold into one of these two forms. Have to. Then, Finally, the protein will continue to, to fold into what we call a tertiary level protein, which is, um, which is usually the final three-dimensional shape of the protein. Um, it is formed and stabilized by weak bonds, again, between the reactive groups, the functional groups on the amino acids. So you can see here's an alpha helix, but these alpha helices all kind of folded in and among themselves to form this final three-dimensional structure, and that's the tertiary level of protein folding. Um, now, this particular thing that we're looking at here, this, this molecule, is called myoglobin. Now, in lab, on Thursday, we had discussed hemoglobin, and I'm going to show you hemoglobin in the next level of protein folding, but this is myoglobin. Myoglobin generally has one protein and then it has the pigment, the heme, and then it has iron in the middle. So this myoglobin is specifically found in the muscle tissue and it also binds to oxygen. So it's kind of special in that respect. Now, most proteins will assume the tertiary structure and that'll be it. However, let's skip this for a second. Some proteins actually take it a step further and assume what's known as a quaternary structure, literally meaning the fourth structure. These are only for proteins that have more than one 
protein subunits. So more than one tertiary level protein covalently bonded together. This is actually hemoglobin, and you can see each color part of it is a different protein that is covalently bonded to the other. So these are the four globin proteins in different colors. And in the center of each one, we have heme. And in the center of the heme, we have iron, just like we talked about in lab on Thursday. Um, and so essentially that iron is gonna bind to the oxygen. Why is this a quaternary level protein? Not because it has four proteins bonded, but because it has just simply more than one bonded together. So that means it's about a quaternary structure. Do you have any questions about that so far? Okay, so now I'm gonna go back one, uh, two slides, and I wanna talk about this word denaturation. So what happens with proteins? Proteins have to be maintained within a very um, specific pH range, specific temperature range. If not, what happens is the protein, the associations between the reactive groups will break and the protein will unfold and it will not be able to fold itself back again to its original state. So what's an example of this that you can think of? Anybody know? What did you eat for breakfast this morning? Lobster. Coffee. You said lobster. Oh, I thought I said lobster. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, monster. Okay, so coffee, monster. Okay. But think about like a traditional breakfast food. What do you eat? Eggs. Right. Eggs. So you got two parts to eggs. You have the white part, you have the yellow part. Which part is the protein part? Mm the white. <laughs> All right. Now, the yellow is generally like the fat part, right? That's where the cholesterol is. Okay, but if you you crack an egg initially, what does that white part look like? Is it white? It's clear, right? And is it liquid or solid? Liquid, right. However, if you add heat to that, you change that protein into a white structure, which is solid. Now, can you ever make that egg white clear again? No, because what you've done is you've denatured that protein. You've caused that protein that made up that clear area to basically unfold, and there's no way it can fold back up again. Not possible. That's, that's protein denaturation, so always think of that example. But changes in pH will do that as well. If, it, if the you know, blood pH, for example, becomes too acidic or too basic, we can denature the hemoglobin that's there. We can denature the globin chains, if possible. This is just some of the different types of bonding. This slide shows us some of the different types of bonding that we can have between the reactive groups. We can have ionic bonding between reactive groups. We can have hydrogen bondings. Uh, we can have something called a disulfide bond, which we really didn't talk about. We can have really weak attractions called van der Waals forces, which again, we didn't really discuss. But this is just showing you that the reactive groups, in order to help the protein to fold, they do have um, uh, this type of bonding dynamic that can occur that causes that protein to be stably formed. Okay. So a lot of proteins are joined or conjugated with other groups. We can have proteins that are bound or associated with sugars. We call them glyco for sugar proteins. Um, and an example of this would be, uh, for example, um, the, uh, the blood group proteins, which we're gonna talk about blood typing, the A, markers, the B markers that you can have on the surface of your blood cells, those are actually glycoproteins. You can have proteins associated with lipids, 
like, for example, high density lipoproteins, your HDLs or your LDLs, those are proteins, they're lipoproteins, they're lipid proteins. They're, they're gonna contain lipids and they can carry around lipids actually. And then others like hemoglobin can contain something that's not a lipid or a sugar, but instead is a pigment. And so here we see some examples of proteins. And I want you to look on here. This, is, this column shows us the number of, of protein uh, components in terms of protein subunits that a particular protein has. I want you to tell me which ones of these, out of hemoglobin, myoglobin, insulin, the blood group proteins, the A and B markers, the antigens, or lipoproteins, which one of these assumes a quaternary level? Hemoglobin, any others? Insulin, right, because both of those have more than one protein that makes them up. Very good. So then myoglobin, the blood group proteins, lipoproteins, these all contain only one protein. There's, there aren't two covalently bonded together, so they just assume a tertiary level structure. And that's it. And this shows, again, some of the non-protein components. So like in hemoglobin and myoglobin that we looked at, Hemoglobin and myoglobin both have a heme pigment, and actually that pigment is another kind of protein that's associated with it. Um, we have the blood group proteins that have carbohydrates, as I mentioned. Uh, the A antigen, the B antigen, those markers are proteins, but they're associated with sugars. And then we have lipoproteins, uh, which are the HDLs and LDLs that have lipids associated with them. Good. Any uh, questions about lipids, or I should say proteins, had lipids on the brain? All right, last macromolecule, then we take a break, uh, nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are made up of building blocks, just like proteins were made up of building blocks called amino acids. Nucleic acids, of which there are two, DNA and RNA, contain building blocks called nucleotides. Nucleotides have this basic structure. They contain a sugar, which is a five carbon sugar, we call a pentose. Um, OSE refers to the sugar part, like glucose, maltose, fructose, right? OSE refers to the sugar part. And then the fact that there are five carbons is the pent part, so pentose, uh, attached to a phosphate. So nucleotides have a sugar and phosphate, and then they're attached to a base. And the base is gonna contain nitrogen. So we call it a nitrogenous base. So that's the nucleotide. Nucleotides covalently bond to each other to form these long chains. So um, in DNA, for example, we have four bases that can attach to the sugar phosphate backbone. We have guanine, cytosine, thymine, sorry, thymine and adenine, uh, which can bond to each other. Now, the bases are gonna be pyrimidines if they contain one ring and purines if they contain two. So they show you here what the purines are uh, because they have the bigger circle, meaning that they have two rings. So guanine and adenine are the two purines, and the pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine. They have the smaller ring. They only have one. And Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin figured out that as a law, basically, purines always bind to pyrimidines. So. <laughs> Which two bases bind? We always get adenine, which is a purine, binding to thymine, which is a pyrimidine. We get cytosine, which is a pyrimidine, binding to guanine, which is a purine. So purines and pyrimidines always bind. Okay, so DNA. DNA contains the pentose, Right, and it's nucleotides. It can, the, the pentose it has is deoxyribose. That's the sugar. And again, it's attached to the phosphate. 
and then we have our bases, right? So these nucleotides are going to be covalently bonded to one of four bases. We have guanine or adenine, which again are the purines, containing two rings, cytosine or thymine, which are the pyrimidines containing one. And again, the backbone is the sugar phosphate, and then we have our base, which is going to help to form that ladder of the DNA molecule when it bonds to another base of another nucleotide on the opposite side. So each base can form what kind of bond? What kind of bond do you think that is? See, that's a bond, but it doesn't look like this one. What kind of bond is this? Hydrogen, right. It, and that also was listed up there, but we know that when you see a dotted line, when you see a dotted line, that means it's hydrogen bond. Why? Because it's a weak bond. Now, I told you that most of these macromolecules, all the ones we've really discussed so far, they all have nonpolar covalent bonds between things. But I told you that there are some, ex some basic exceptions that you have, and one exception are the hydrogen bonds, okay? But it works here because this is basically, these are nitrogenous bases that eventually, when we learn about DNA transcription and translation, these bonds will have to break at certain times to expose genes on our DNA. So that's why the weak hydrogen bonds work really well in this, in this arrangement between the bases. Okay, so the two strands of DNA because of the purine and pyrimidine bonding arrangement always forms a helical ladder. And again, the number of purines equals the number of pyrimidines because you can only bind one purine to one pyrimidine. Adenine and thymine can bind cytosine with guanine, as you see here. The ATCG rules. Okay, now RNA is a single-stranded molecule, uh, and it has a pentose. Its sugar is not deoxyribose, but it is just ribose. <laughs> Remember, RNA stands for what? Ribonucleic acid. Ribo because ribose is the sugar. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Why? Because deoxyribose is the sugar. Both are five carbon sugars. Okay. So ribose is going to be bonded to one of four bases, guanine or cytosine or adenine or not thymine, but uracil. Uracil is the one exception there. And again, it is single stranded. So tell me, what are three differences between DNA and RNA? The sugar, what's DNA sugar? Deoxyribose, what's RNA sugar? Ribose, right? What's another example? What's another difference? Which one? Okay, good. So which one has your cell? Or RNA has your cell, and DNA in place of your cell has what? Thymine. Very good. Okay. And what's the third difference? This is an easy one. You did good, you did two out of three. What'd you say? RNA single-stranded. Yeah, RNA single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. Exactly. It's good. So, you got that down? That's good. And we'll be picking up talking more about DNA and RNA uh, with chapter three, the end of chapter three. So, we didn't get there yet. So, let's take 10 and come back about uh, 10, 